Namaste. Well, today I have a fun subject. Anger man management. Today's subject is anger management. But I thought that maybe I would stretch the title a little bit and, and say frustration, anger management, and well-being management. Because the subject of anger has much more to do with how you feel when you're not angry and then it does about anger itself. When you say anger management, I, what it means to me is that, okay, now you're angry, what are you going to do with it? And the much more valuable subject is how not to get angry, how to avoid putting yourself in that position. But it, uh, it starts very early. In fact, this whole subject started many, 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 many incarnations ago. And uh, I think it's uh, an international uh, understanding that um, we all have buttons that get pushed in life. And when our particular button gets pushed, we can become angry. And uh, people have different buttons. It's very interesting how uh, uh, you do, some, something happens to this person, they don't even notice. But the same thing happens to another person, it's their button, and, you know, I won't say it, but, you know, okay, well, all hell breaks out. <laughs> you know, they go crazy. And isn't it interesting that life is designed in such a way that our buttons get pushed? <laughs> but the thing is that most people will pray, Lord, Please don't push my button. Don't put me in that position. And we think that the best incarnation would be you live your whole lifetime and your button never gets pushed. We don't think that we shouldn't have buttons. <laughs> we don't think that we shouldn't not react to life that way. We think that life shouldn't push our button. So to understand this a little bit better, we have to go back a ways. Um, this is a subject that I am personally very well acquainted with. <laughs> um, you know, uh, uh, when I was young, you can't tell now, but I had very fiery red hair. And I must have had some Irish in my background somewhere, because I had a flash temper. But the thing is, is that I had this way before I knew anything about having a temper or anything else. My mother tells me a story. I don't remember it, but I don't doubt that it happened at all. Uh, I probably was three or four years old, and she took me to the supermarket one day, and, you know, we have the, the, the basket, the, the cart, and so I was in the cart. I guess I wasn't in the cart at the time. Anyway, you know how kids, once they get into the, the store, they start grabbing things, and they want them. Well, apparently there was a point at which I wanted an item that she didn't feel that I should have. And so I basically laid down on the, on the floor of the, of the market and had a temper tantrum. <laughs> and I was yelling at the top of my lungs and I was kicking my feet and shaking my arms. I mean, the full thing, the full thing. And uh, I thought that she had a pretty good... Um, uh, response to that. And in America today, uh, parents would not probably do this. But this was quite a few years ago. <laughs> and uh, uh, at that time, people weren't worried about their kids being abducted when they weren't looking. So uh, she walked away. I, and I was so busy having my tantrum that I didn't notice. <laughs> And so, at some point, when I, you know, kind of like looked up and took a breath, I went, oh, there's nobody here. <laughs> it was really effective, so I jumped up and went searching for her. And by the time I found her, I was so happy to see her that, you know, I had forgotten the whole thing. And it's easy to look at children and say, oh, you know, they got overexcited. 
And, uh, but there's a real secret to understanding. Uh, anger is real simple. It's very simple. It can be manifested or activated by an infinite number of individualized items. But the basic process is very simple. I wanted something. I didn't get it. It made me angry. Yoganandaji described it, defined anger as uh, our reaction, our negative reaction to thwarted desires. We don't get what we want. Or something happens that we do get something that we don't want. <laughs> Either way, we don't get what we want or we get something that we don't want. And this is the whole delusion that we live in in life. Is that is is, is our our likes and our dislikes, and these likes and dislikes come from not only this lifetime, but previous lifetimes. We have karmas in our side of ourselves, and you can meet a person who's never angry, but one day, <laughs> under one circumstance, somehow you push that button and they explode. And you see people who also. Uh, um, the thing is about anger is if you're suppressing anger, if you're if you have anger but you never show it, that's not the same as not responding with anger. So many people think that just by looking good on the outside, that somehow makes you good on the inside, but that's just not true. And and so many people will say, well, uh, I did this. Uh, uh, act that caused harm to somebody else, but it was just business. I didn't mean it personally. Well, life doesn't work like that. You still get the bad karma for doing it. You might as well admit it. You did something that hurt somebody else. And a lot of people think that, well, oh, it's just me, and it's just something I did to myself. I got angry. But anger is like a bomb of negative energy that goes out and affects others. If we to go back to that point, if we suppress our anger, what often happens is, is that it builds up and eventually it will explode. And uh, we've seen this over the years. People who suppress their feelings, and it says in the Gita, it says the path of, of suppression doesn't work. It just simply doesn't work. It just delays things. <laughs> One of the keys in the spiritual life is to be honest. Without self-honesty, we can't, we can't build the mansion of our higher consciousness. We really cannot, because eventually, as much good as we do on top of that dishonesty, many people are selfish by nature, but do good things for others. But underneath that, they have the desire to get something in return. That's a form of selfishness. But they are doing good things for others. But what happens is they build this whole beautiful uh, structure of good deeds, but one day it will collapse. And they'll find themselves having to uh, start the foundation of their spiritual life all over again. We've all done this many times. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's not like we can't escape it until we consciously recognize it. And this is one of the keys in changing all habits, all reactions to life that we don't feel comfortable with, that don't lead to happiness. I mean, why, why isn't it okay to be angry? A lot of people would say, many psych psychologists would say, get angry, let it out. In fact, there was this big um, uh, a thing years ago, I don't know if people did, still do it, called the primal scream. I have this very funny story to tell. I can't. This is a perfect time. So, uh, some years ago, I was living in, at the village, and uh, you know, Ananda has always been a place where, of course, we follow these teachings, but we allow for uh, uh, individual creativity, and you know, people would always experiment with things, and uh, and some of us would think, oh, well, that's really silly, but at the same time, we wouldn't stop them from doing it. They, they just have to figure it out for themselves. So I lived in a very secluded area of the village, and there was a pond nearby, and uh, some of the people had built a sweat lodge, uh, an actual 
igloo-shaped sweat lodge, with, but with clay bricks, very uh, like they might do in a country here in, in India. And then they fired it. They built a, a fire inside, and they and they uh, uh, fired it, and it, it it you know was nice. So people would go in and create kind of like an American Indian sweat lodge kind of environment. And so one night in the middle of the night, I hear this. Ah! I mean, it was like blood curdling scream, and I'm going. Oh my goodness, what is going on? And uh, so I was lying in bed on the way, what just happened? And I said, Oh, I hope it goes away, I hope it doesn't happen again. Because <laughs> I don't even want to know what that was. And, uh, but, but, you know, five or, or six minutes later, ah! And it, it, it sounded like, uh, you know, my imagination and, you know, too many movies or whatever, but somebody had a knife and they were, you know, stabbing somebody. I was pretty convinced that that was what was going on. And so it, it's happened a second time, and now, now I have a dilemma. Because I'm beginning to feel a certain responsibility to find out what's going on. But the way it sounded, I didn't really want to know. <laughs> it didn't sound like something that was going to be fun to, to interact with. Well, so once more, I let it go. And with, with guilt, <laughs> but but I don't know. Oh, you know, nature is taking place. Okay, you know. So, but the, the third time I couldn't ignore it, and and so it, I had to get up. So I got up, and I didn't even I didn't have a flashlight. So which we often did. You know, you think you live out in the forest. There's no street lamps. Yet, but we got used to walking around in the forest without flashlights, and most of the time there was moonlight and such, and you. Feel the path with your feet, and you, you know, get around. So, but I, I walked outside, I walked on the path, I went around the lake, and while I was walking, I heard the scream again, and saw that it, heard that it was coming from the sweat lodge. So, I went up to the door of the sweat lodge, and I'm out there thinking, oh, what do I do now? I don't really want to go in, but I have to find out what's going on. So while I'm standing out there, ah, somebody just yells their head off, and I'm like, oh my goodness, okay, I'm going to do it. So I, I went, but I didn't go right, I went, hello, <laughs> hello, and somebody right away, someone went, oh, hello, who's that? I said, it's Vijay, who's in there? And the fellow said who he was, I says, <laughs> And then he says, oh, are we disturbing you? <laughs> and they were in there doing this sort of native primal scream thing where you just let it all out. <laughs> and so, <"Rah!"> and <laughs> this does not lead to freedom from an emotional, excessive emotional reaction. It, it has certain entertainment value, I'll admit it. But, and, but, but it's connected to this theory of catharsis. If you can somehow get your emotions to be completely expiated through indulgence in the emotion, then it will be released and no longer be suppressed. But the reality is, is that, well, in this case it was incredibly humorous, but at least to me it was, it made me laugh, but I didn't. I didn't say anything insulting to them. I just said, oh, okay, good, good. I'm glad you're okay. I was really glad that there was no knives involved, I really. So, but um, this is common thinking, is, is that we can get rid of our negative emotions by expressing them. But the reality is that these emotions cre actually create an energetic kind of fire in our astral body, in our consciousness. And Yoganandaji actually suggested that if, when people feel very strong emotions like anger, to take ice and put it on your eyelids and your spiritual eye and on your medulla. And uh, uh, the point he's trying to make is, is that, that this has a very strong effect. It's like it's setting off a bomb in your consciousness, a bomb of negativity. 
And so what we want to do is, but we don't want to suppress. We don't want to suppress our emotions. If you respond to anger or a situation with anger, what you need to do is redirect it. And so, of course, I'd say there is a certain value, for example, in punching bags. <laughs> It'd be better to suppress it in the moment, take it home, and punch the bag. You know, I mean, that's not the highest way to go, but it is a way to go. Take a walk, run. Running is great. You feel anger, go run and run it off. Okay, but, uh, and of course, we all know uh, that even uh, uh, all of the world uses pranayama, they don't even realize it, when they simply say, take a deep breath, <laughs> count to 10. <laughs> yeah. Everybody knows that, but this is pranayama. What are you doing? You're redirecting your energy. You're taking your energy and instead of expressing it in anger, is you're grabbing that energy and you're controlling it through an act of will and redirecting it. And if you only to re redirect it towards calmness, towards not being angry, I should say, then, then at least that's a step in the right direction. But what we really need to do is redirect all negative emotions towards calmness and then build ourselves up a, a reservoir of calmness in our consciousness over time so that we don't respond with it, to life experiences with anger. I remember a, uh, an experience that I have that, that, that I had that uh, I was... Um, very reactive. And uh, when, uh, when I was younger, I was even more reactive than I am today. <laughs> Let me say, some improvement has taken place. And uh, when I first came to Ananda, if somebody would uh, um, say something that I disagreed with, it was very difficult for me not to respond back. And uh, but one time I was keeping silence. And uh, uh, but I had gone to, to, to work, and you know, there ended up being a meeting uh, in the publications department. I was doing a non recordings at the time. And so there was a meeting, and at these meetings, uh, most of the time, uh, Kriyananjiji wouldn't come. But occasionally he would, and at this particular meeting, he came. And so he, um, he began to speak. And of course, we all loved, you know, he, you know, he, he took over and we all would just, just enjoy being with him. We didn't really care what happened as long as we could uh, uh, be with him. And so, but the thing is, is that instead of discussing business, he started discussing a, a, a particular subject. And it, and it happened to be a subject that I was, uh, that I was connected to. And, and, and he, did, he just started kind of slowly, and then he just wrapped it up. And, and, and it was just, I'm thinking, well, that's not right. Well, that's not right. That's, that's complete distortion. That's not correct. And it, but I was in silence. So, you know, I can't do anything. Until finally, he just, get, get, it was getting worse and worse and worse. Finally, I couldn't control myself. And I just blurted out. And as soon as I started to talk, he cut me off. And he said, I knew I could make you talk. <laughs> I knew I could make you talk. And this is what God is doing to us every day. When somebody makes you angry, when somehow your buttons get pushed, who is pushing the button? That person is just an instrument. God is pushing the button. Why is God pushing the button? Because it's your karma to have that button pushed. Why is it your karma to have that button pushed? Because you have a like or a dislike associated with that. And school is always in. It's a pop quiz. It's a test. It's a test, guys, going, how are you going to react? What are you going to do with this today? You're going to learn this lesson today? You're going to figure this out today? Or are you going to wait? You're going to get angry? 
and create a big mess and then have to face it again. When things happen in our lives that we don't like, who's, who's giving it to us? Now if God, if you were in God's presence and God gave you sour medicine, would you eat it? Of course you'd eat it. God, the ultimate parent, the ultimate person, the, uh, or you know, being of love, source of love. The ultimate source of love is said, you need a little sour today. So are we going to go, oh no, Lord, no sour for me. <laughs> you can't. Because why does the source of love give you sour today? Because you need it. It's good for you. What does that good for you mean? That means that this will lead to joy. This will lead to freedom. What if we reject sour? What even if the doctor comes and says, uh, here's the medicine, you say, I won't take medicine. It leads to suffering. It's that simple. When we get angry, we suffer. And if we cause suffering to others while we suffer, then we're going to suffer more. <laughs> we create this whole chain of reactions of suffering. And think about it. What if you cause someone else to suffer, and then their suffering causes someone else to suffer? And there, this is this is a really long chain of suffering. Why? You, you caused it. You caused a landslide of suffering. What if you cause someone to suffer, and then they get really excited, and they kill somebody? or they drive their car into a tree, or some terrible thing. And how many stories are there of people who the last words that they had with a loved one before that loved one passed were words of anger? And how you feel about that being the somehow the parting gift, I love you, <laughs> oh, you're really gone. I didn't mean to kill you. People will even say, you know, I wish you were dead. And then the person dies, and now how do they feel? They didn't really mean it. Oh, I didn't mean that. And of course they didn't mean it in the ultimate sense. But what they got caught in was the dark, the darkness, the dark potential, the negative potential in life. It caught them. And this is the dance we dance every day. The positive dance, the negative dance. The best um, defense for anger is well-being, is to change the way that we react to life. And the way to change the, react, the way that we react to life is not to, yes, you can use basic, you know, psychological technique. You can try to avoid situations where you know you aren't going to be happy there. Okay, but uh, the truth is that is is, uh, and you can catch yourself early. In other words, in other words, uh, when you see yourself, feel yourself starting to percolate, you catch yourself before you boil over, and just redirect your energy. Okay, this is a this is a practical thing to do, but you, your parents do this all the time. Parents. And this is one of, the, one of the life lessons that we learn in parenting, is how to deal with your frustrations. Because the kid isn't getting it. Or, or the kid is just doing something that isn't really bad in itself, but it just bugs you. You just don't like it. And you even recognize that there's nothing wrong with the child doing it, except that it bothers you. It's driving you crazy. And, 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 but you have to recognize it and redirect it. Sometimes you have to teach the child to respect your feelings too. Sometimes you have to allow them to be themselves even if you find it a little irritating. I remember when my kids were growing up and they would get in the car, I'm a person that likes quiet. You know, I just don't want noise all the time. Well, but kids are, uh, tend to, uh, some kids are quite talkative and they'll start chattering, and they'll start, 
and it's not like they're really having meaningful conversation of any kind. They're just expressing restlessness. And so uh, that would, you know, challenge me. <laughs> and some kid, parents would just, you know, tell their kids to shut up. But I always felt that telling somebody to shut up wasn't very nice. And there may be, there is a time and a place to do things like that. I'll get to that in a moment. But most of the time we should be nice. So what I did is uh, came up with a secret code for my kids. And um, uh, we had a code when you get in the car, it was one, two, three. One, get in the car. Two, uh, uh, sit in your seat. Three, buckle your seatbelt. So uh, we'd get in the car, one, two, three, and everybody would go, one, two, three. It was a little bit of a game. But it was, you know, it helped people to get into their seat and buckle their seatbelt, which we were very uh, regular with. So I came up with the, the new code was 125. 125 was not shut up. It was put space between the words. You don't have to stop talking, but just put a little space between the words. And they got it. And so if I started to feel a little bit like, okay, enough, I'd go, one, two, five. <laughs> and they, they got it. It wasn't hard. I wasn't telling them to shut up. I was telling them to just slow it down a little bit. Put a little space between the words. There are a lot of things in life that if we'll come up with a little strategy like that, which will alleviate the circumstance in a way that everybody feels more comfortable. And this is one of the things that we can do, is become uh, uh, creative and to uh, use this as an opportunity to deepen your relationship with God by inviting God to guide you in creative ideas. And if you begin to open yourself up to this, you will, uh, God will, God will give you the test, but God will also give you the solution. <laughs> Now, there is a time to stand up against things in life. And uh, the, uh, uh, the way we describe this is what you might call righteous indignation. When you've got to stand up against something that's just wrong. Uh, one of the most famous stories of this, of course, is Jesus who uh, was in the temple and he saw the money changers in the temple and he uh, saw them as a, uh, a negative invasion uh, in a place that was for God. They were, you know, just only about business. And so, of course, they had been there every day <laughs> for who knows how long. And he'd been there many times before and didn't say a thing. But on that day, he felt inspired to stand up against them and he literally pushed their, their tables over and drove them out. Now there's a very important difference between what he did and what most uh, people do when uh, there's some pretty funny videos on YouTube. Um, uh, people who got angry at work <laughs> and because they have security cameras now in so many places they catch these people having meltdown tantrums and they're just like me when I was three years old, but instead of lying on the ground and kicking and screaming, they pick up the computer and they throw it against the wall, or the, you know, they try to smash things. And, and it's terrible and it's funny, I don't know, it's, um, but it's quite common. But they're a, 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 a not expressing righteous indignation. They are really mad. <laughs> they have been overcome by their emotions. I had a very uh, educational uh, experience on this subject with green energy uh, because, um, well, in the 70s, as some of you know this, that I uh, came to India with green energy and we spent some time in seclusion in uh, uh, Kashmir. And uh, we had our home and, and uh, uh, it was the beginning of our time there. and. Uh, um, in the first month of our time there, there was another fellow there. And so we would meditate together. 
And uh, we were just starting seclusion and Swamiji gave us a pep talk on, you know, really giving it our best energy and, and applying ourselves. And so uh, the next morning we got, you know, we were inspired by his, 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 his inspirational talk, motivational talk. And uh, we got it like four o'clock in the morning. And, and, and what, you know, how do we begin? We start chanting. So now we are chanting at the top of our lungs, 4 o'clock in the morning, and Swamiji's bedroom is right on the other side of the wall. <laughs> so the next thing we know, Swamiji has come up out of his room, and his, he's in his pajamas, and his hair is all wild. <laughs> and he goes, what are you guys doing? <laughs> and we were like completely shocked. And, and, and like a gap, I mean, we had like, oh my goodness, we've disturbed Swamiji. I mean, we knew right away we had disturbed him, but he'd given us this, pep, this talk about, you know, it's his own fault, you know? So we're really, you know, we're kind of on both sides of the fence. We can see his point of view, but we can also see our point of view. At the at the Swam, you know, Swamiji just said, look, uh, he said, look, let's say no chanting before 6 a.m. <laughs> Which was completely reasonable, you know. No chanting before 6 a.m. So he went away, you know. And of course, I thought about that moment for many years. And uh, many years later, I, I, was, I wrote a book and mentioned this. And, and then after I wrote the book, I... I gave the book to Swamiji to read before I, I published it. And I asked for his, his input. And in the book I had described this situation and, and described Swamiji as being, you know, angry. And, uh, and he, said, he said to me, um, he didn't tell me, you know, what I should say or not, but he said, he said, Vijaya, I wasn't angry. And then he said, I have gotten angry a few times. He, he, Swami didn't get angry very often. It was very hard to make him angry. And none of us really had ever seen him angry. I mean, that was so unusual that to me that was anger. But he said, he said to me, he said, I got angry once because this fellow, one of our younger monks, had installed a heater in new construction, they, it was at the Crystal Hermitage, and they built this new room, and they just put this brand new carpet in. And this heating system had a oil, heating oil, and which was a t like a water line attached to the heater, and then you turn on the oil and it flows into the heat, the heat. But the fellow had done everything except hook the line to the heater. So when he turned the oil on, it just leaked on, on the brand new carpeting which became absolutely ruined. And for whatever reason, that made Swamiji angry, and he said, that really made me angry, that was stupid. <laughs> you know? So, uh, of course, now I'm having a dilemma, says, now I have to write the truth as I see it. I can't, just because Swamiji told me he wasn't angry, th does that mean I should say he wasn't angry, even if, I, I have to figure this out. So I really put myself into that moment because it was a very strong moment. It was so unusual in my experience. And I put myself back in that moment and I meditated on it and, and tried to feel what it felt like in that moment at that time. And what I got was I... And I had made a habit of doing this, whether I was successful to whatever degree over the years, I suppose that could be debated, but I often tried to reach into Swamiji and feel what he was feeling. I mean, this was one of the things that, sort of the magical ways in which I personally related to him. And I had the opportunity to do this over many years. And so I would basically try to be Swami's, in Swami's head be in his consciousness. And I recognized something in him 
that made the difference between being frustrated and being angry. And I want to uh, describe it, I'll come back to that in a second, but I want to describe it in another experience that, I, that I've observed about my own response to life. And that is, um, have you ever played um, uh, a card game online? You know, on a computer? Anybody? anybody? Cards? You know, playing cards? Have, have, has anybody played, played on their computer cards? A solitaire, okay, that's, that's more common. Um, solitaire is not as good an example of, of what I'm going to talk about as another card game called Hearts. In Hearts, I enjoy playing Hearts. I was taught by my grandmother, and it's a, a good memory. I enjoy it. You have to use your brain. And uh, there's four players. So when you're playing uh, uh, on the computer, you can give them names, or you can just leave them the computer-generated name. But there's, there's, there's three other players, and there's you, but they're all a computer. There's nobody there. It's just a computer. <laughs> but then there's you. So I'm playing this, this game, Hearts, and, and you know, you have a good hand, you have a bad hand. So when you have a bad hand, it means that one of your competitors uh, got you. And so I began to notice my reaction to the competitor getting me, he says, I'm going to get you back. I mean, this is a computer. But this reaction process was, you did something that I didn't like, I'm going to get you back. And that is the difference in anger. In anger, there is an impulse against the, the person or the situation. In frustration, there's no impulse against it. In other words, my child is irritating me, but I'm not against the child. If I get angry and smack the child, I'm against the child. That's another subject, whether you should smack your kids or not. But the point is that you, ahimsa, the, the threshold of ahimsa is, is there an intent to do harm? Is there intent to uh, to um, reciprocate in some way, to have that negative energy flow back to the source. That is the difference. And so, in that moment, I had to say, Swamiji did not exhibit. And I never, ever exhibited in him. I never saw in him uh, uh, any time when he wanted something bad to happen to the person who had wronged wanted something bad to happen. And this is one of the, the easy calling cards of a negative consciousness, is you desire to do harm in, in reaction to. So when you're driving down the road, uh, it, do you just not want that person to cut in front of you? Or do you want to pull out your laser gun and zap them? You know? And then we have to never forget, who pulled in front of me? Who pushed my button? We have to remember this. God is doing everything. God is reacting through us. The question is, is what level of God? Do we want to be deluded God, or do we want to be free God? And what are we representing? What is flowing through our consciousness? So we have to honestly recognize when we become angry in life, when we have negative uh, emotional responses. This is the same for all negative emotional responses. And then we have to recognize that the, the, the you know, okay, what am I going to do with this? And I know that life is going to present me with challenges. So I, you know, if you knew you were going to be tested in accounting, you would study accounting. If you knew you were going to be tested in any area of life, you would prepare for it. We have to prepare for the, for the fact that life is going to try to make us upset. It's going to make us, try to make us angry about something. The number one way to prepare is through communion with spirit. 
in deep meditation, in the awakening of our, our, our inner joyful, loving, well-being connection to spirit, what happens is that um, <clears throat> it's like if you're a little baby and a mosquito bites you, it's quite uncomfortable. You're a little baby. But if you're a full-grown elephant and a mosquito gets on there, nothing's going to happen. You're big and strong. If you, that little mosquito doesn't affect you. That means that the more we become connected to inner well-being, the less, it takes a bigger challenge to bother us. You can imagine that uh, Jesus not much bothered him. When he got in the, up on the cross and they literally nailed him to the cross, there was only a moment when he considered not, not accepting. And then he said, no, Lord, forgive them for what they do. Can we forgive whatever form of life is pushing our button and say, okay, I accept. How do we have the strength to do that? Through our inner connection to spirit. What I've observed about myself is that over the years, and to, and to me, and this is, this is a Swamiji speaking, uh, is that he's taught us that one of the most important ways that we recognize spiritual growth is just a, a sense of inner well-being. It's just, it's not visions, it's not whether you hear Om or see the spiritual eye. Yes, those things can happen. Not everybody experiences them. But everybody has a sense of growing strength and awareness of their inner positive communion and joy, peace, calmness, energy, concentration, inner life. And that this strengthens you. It makes you immune to, uh, just like a vaccination, to uh, at least lower levels of agitation. And eventually, Nothing can bother you. And so they say that the, that the um, one of the signs of great devotees is that they can stand unshaken amidst crashing worlds. You just simply no longer react with that negative emotional response. If it's your duty to stand up and say, I have to stand against this, you do so with strength but without any intent to do harm. And most of the time, it's not ours to do. So uh, you just shine the light and God's will be done. But you have to have the strength to do that. In order to have the strength to do that, we have to meditate. We have to cultivate that inner relationship. We have to commit ourselves to that inner transformation. That inner transformation is the key to freedom and to happiness. To non-excessive emotional responses. So don't, but don't beat yourself up and say, oh, hey, I got angry. Okay. Accept it. Acknowledge it. You know, God likes to keep us humble too. <laughs> and I, I see this all the time. God, God is going, be dry. Let's, let's see if that will get you today. And God knows my buttons well. So now I know that God's trying to push that button. He's going, oh, the button's broken. Let's see if I can keep pushing it. And now, now I laugh. Now it's funny. Now it's really funny. So when you see God trying to push your button, go, ha, 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 ha. I got you, God. I got you trying to push my button. Okay, push away. And if you make fun out of it, and you kind of make fun of yourself, and you allow yourself to be who you are, but do those things that will free you, that will give you more joy, that will, and then that will in, in turn spread the joy. So when you uh, find yourself on the verge of anger, catch yourself, redirect your energy, give it to God. Let God be both sides of the fence in all relationships in life. And in that, we can experience God's bliss, God's peace, God's love, no matter what happens.